much. Can I uh, welcome everyone to this, the 28th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2012. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as the interview of the broadcasting system, even when switched to silent? And rather ironically, I don't like people tweeting, blackberrying or anything during committee sessions. We have received apologies from Sandra White, and I welcome Gordon MacDonald, who is attending in her place. And David, I think you're here, David. We're all jiggled about today, just to confuse you. Now, I'll go to item one in the agenda, the role of media in criminal trials. And the, this is an, a one-off evidence session on the role of the media in criminal trials and associated uh, activities, as it were, with court proceedings. Um, we are gathering evidence to inform, we hope, a Scottish Parliament chamber debate on the same topic later this month. And I welcome our witnesses to the meeting today who are interspersed, you have been interspersed against your will, amongst members around the table. The aim being to encourage a more open and informal debate and discussion. In particular, witnesses are welcome. It's weird, weird in the background, members of the committee today. I want uh, the witnesses to interact with each other, but please, through the chair, so I can, uh, you know, just to some extent um, regulate the discussion and it will make sense on the official report. But we, we will really not be involving ourselves too much in it. We're here to listen and learn. Um, now, I've got, if I think we could just start out by going round uh, and introducing who we are and who we represent. Anwar. Um, Amar Anwar, a criminal defence solicitor. David McClatchy, member of the committee. Uh, Magnus Linklater, a columnist for The Times. John Finney, committee member. Uh, Alistair Blankson, formerly BBC's lawyer in Scotland. Roderick Campbell, member of the committee. John Cuddehy, ACPOS. Ian McKee, Justice Campaigner. David Harvey, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Colin Keir, Member of the Committee. Uh, Donald Finlay, I'm the Chairman of the Faculty of Advocates Criminal Bar Association. Gordon MacDonald, a Member of the Committee. I'm Stephen Rayburn, I'm Editor and Publisher of the Firm Magazine and a Trainer in Social Media. Alison McInnes, Member of the Committee. I'm Matt Roper, Digital News Editor at STV. I'm an honoured lawyer at STV. Graham Pearson, Member of the Committee. Alan McCloskey, Victim Support Scotland. And Christine Graham, who I chair this um, committee. Can I then just uh, thank you all who have submitted uh, written submissions to us in advance, and can I perhaps just ask a member to start off? I, I know I said they're not going to say very much, but at least that's what I'm telling them now. Any member want to start off by asking a question just to get the discussion going? John. Well, what are the challenges, given the, the rapid expansion of social media, to ensure that all aspects of justice are properly addressed? Yes, we have concerns about somehow it may or may not be getting out of control uh, and may affect the way justice is done, as well as seem to be done. Now, could I, so I'd like my old history teacher said, discuss. So who would like to start the discussion? Can I take a Magnus Link later, yes. Can I just take a wee step back um, because I mean obviously that is the, the central issue when it comes to discussing particularly contempt uh, as far as the media is concerned but I think that in context one, one needs to realize that already there was quite a lot of confusion in Scotland about contempt uh, I, I arrived at back in 1988 as editor of the Scotsman uh, and, and was in absolutely no doubt that the position in Scotland was a great deal tougher than that in England that I'd been used to. Uh, and there were many stories of uh, editors being fined, really hefty amounts by uh, after uh, issues of contempt, which in England probably wouldn't, would have escaped notice, but in Scotland were picked up. And, and I remember a a particular uh, ex example of this when uh, there had been uh, an incident at Edinburgh Airport when a certain football manager, I think it was Tommy McLean of Dundee United, had, had uh, floored a TV reporter, probably quite justifiably, but uh, he, uh, uh, he was charged that night. And so we sought advice from the Crown Office and were told that nothing could be published. And the Sun, next day, had the story in full on its front page with a picture. And when I rang up to 
complained to the Crown Office, was told, well, that's the sun. Uh, there's a different uh, sort of perspective for a newspaper like that. In the Scotsman, it wouldn't be permitted. So that story is simply to illustrate the fact that I think already in the, there has been down the years quite a lot of both confusion within Scotland about the application of the laws of contempt to the media, but also a, a, a great uh, yawning gap between uh, contempt in Scotland and in England, which, if anything, has grown, I would argue. Ian McKee. I just, uh, good morning, convener. Good morning, morning everyone. Um, I'd like to get in now before the media and the lawyers and the politicians start. So. Um, and I'd just like perhaps to outline, I'm coming in from a slightly different angle from, I think, from many people around this table, in that um, I'm a firm believer in the role of the media, and my experience as a justice campaigner, particularly for my daughter in Lockerbie, brought home the value of the media. So I'm totally in the media part. We need the media. We need a strong media. We need challenge from the media. That's the background to it. The digital age, we can't, <clears throat> we can't disappear. We can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's out the bottle. But I would like you to consider looking at also from a system, a system point of view, because my experiences tell me that you're not going to sort out all of this through repressive legislation, rules and procedures, or as one of the papers said, jailing jurors. I think you're going to have to look at it from a cultural and a system point of view, because unless we change the system inherent in Scotland at the moment, we're not going to change anything. What you'll get is first aid instead of the major surgery that's required. I, I do believe that um, openness and accountability is a major, major item in Scotland, and there's the freedom of information, for instance, the complaints that were made about the lack of that, the fact that myself was refused thousands of documents. Openness and accountability at the Crown Office, it's not something that I would think that they're particularly uh, known for. And if you don't have account openness and accountability, how can the media get the information they need? This is when the social media come in and they start to just make up their own stories and the truth disappears. So I, was, I would ask you to put, even if it's not done in debate, to put openness and accountability in the forefront. And also, I would like to you consider certainly jury reform, but not locking up jurors. I just cannot see, see that one at all. I can't see repressive legislation working. I believe ideas, you should be looking at ideas like professional jurors, people who are in fact able, if you like, you're able to train, they're able to handle the social media, people that can be trusted, because quite bluntly, I think the jury system, it's the emperor with no clothes on. It's good to look at, it's very traditional, people love to say it's a wonderful thing. I'm not sure it is, and I think unless you look at jury reform, then the media problems are going to continue. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Alvin Anwar, then Steve Rayburn. Good morning. Uh, I think the first point is that the Contempt of Court Act that we have in Scotland has significant powers. The problem has been for a number of us practitioners, um, whether they be lawyers or whether they be the media, is that the remit is so wide, but the rules are unclear. There's no specific guidelines really in what you can and what you can't do. There's advising in terms of you can do this and you can't do that, but generally speaking, most people don't know uh, what it means. But I think it needs to be recognised um, that the media has a role to play in the courts, and it's important that we have a free press. If it hadn't been for the free press, then the issues such as child abuse, um, human trafficking of women for prostitution, um, honour killings, um, and, and rape would have remained hidden away. And we've seen in recent times with the question of Hillsborough, phone hacking in Levison, how important the, the, the media is. Um, but I have a real concern um, that when we seem to be having this headlong rush into the fact that because England and Wales have allowed it with the issue of Twitter and, and especially the question of televising of, um, of, of trials, that, that we should allow it. I think there's a big difference between allowing live stream for the Supreme Court where cameras are focused on um, Supreme Court judges um, uh, and not on witnesses or um, individuals to that of replacing a camera consistently in high court trials. The concern I have is that from experience, we know that there are resource issues um, for the media anyway. Um, and by and large, for, for us as practitioners, it can be extremely frustrating sitting through a trial that can sometimes last from two days through to several months. Um, and then watching what comes out, the six o'clock news every day, and it doesn't actually, summar it summarises, the tent is summarise, you know, the, the whole course of the day proceedings. And actually what it does is it picks the most sensational element, and there is a real danger that if cameras are allowed in without limitations in high court trials, that they'll succeed in trivialising the, pr the proceedings, that they'll reduce them to the OJ Simpson 
element. And there's no getting around the fact that whether it be STV, Channel 4 or BBC with the greatest of intentions, it is a question of prime time um, entertainment. And we have focused quite a deal in this country recently on the rights of victim. Nobody's answered the question, why an accused who's acquitted should have his trial shown on, on television. And in the days of YouTube, you will have that, the, the cross-examination, the allegations replayed again and again and again. And then if we move in beyond that to the question of the individual who's been found guilty, what about their rehabilitation? What about their vulnerability when they enter the prison system or the endangerment to them that they could be killed or they could be stabbed or whatever it may be um, simply because of a television report? And I think that's the price that we would pay if we allowed cameras into the courtrooms without the limitations. Um, I don't believe that we believe in mob justice or vigilante justice and in democracy we have a duty to protect the guilty as well as the innocent and we should not allow our courtrooms to to be reduced to, to prime time entertainment. It means a lot more than that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've got Steve Rayburn followed by Alistair Bonington and Matt Roper, please. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, the question that you asked was what are the issues that are presented by um, social media? And they can be summarised, I think, very, very simply. Um, the law that regulates everything that goes on in the courts, that's the cornerstone of this, is a Contempt of Court Act, which is uh, an excellent piece of legislation insofar as it applies to the print and the broadcast media. Very few issues there. The advancement of social media means that everybody who has the capability to uh, use a smartphone or an iPad or a computer has the same power that was formerly restrained only to broadcasters and to editors. And <coughs> the distinction there, of course, is that lay members of the public and those that are not media trained uh, can't be presumed to know the constraints in the Contempt of Court Act. So it turns lay people into broadcasters with the ability to reach thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people easily and swiftly without having the prerequisite knowledge. The law dates from 1981. At that point, it was perfectly adequate, but I, I described it as um, a bow and arrow against chemical warfare. It's completely inappropriate to even consider governing social media in its current form. It requires massive and fundamental overhaul if it's going to have any impact on the use of social media. It just simply cannot be applied to it. It does work fairly well, as we've all seen, with print and broadcast media who adhere to its terms. Um, but the members of the public can't be expected to know or presumed to know, and they don't know. Thank you. I've got Alistair Warrington, Matt Roper, and then Al McCloskey, please. Yeah, just to give a bit of background to the discussion on contempt of court, I think it's important to understand that contempt of court was imposed in this country by the European Court of Human Rights because our uh, anti-press uh, attitude in the UK was so extreme that we fell foul of the European Court and we lose, we still lose almost every case before the European Court involving media, quite rightly. Uh, now, Contempt of court in Scotland has, as Magnus has said, has always been much more restrictive than in England, despite the fact it's the same act. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is not only can the Lord Advocate, as prosecutor in the public interest, take a case to court, so can the accused person and the judge can raise it ex proprio motu. So the press are in much more danger uh, as a matter of procedure in Scotland. And added to that is the fact that Scotland has interpreted the Act very restrictively against the media. And as I say, we lose all the cases quite rightly in the European Court. Uh, even at, uh, The European Court is not the quickest thing in the world, as you probably know, and it took three years after my retirement for me to win my last case. But I did win it, I'm pleased to tell you. Uh, regarding social media, um, one of the things that I dislike is legislation that's useless. Uh, and I would suggest that any parliament passing legislation that's useless is being rather foolish because it discredits any legislation that you pass that might be of some purpose. And with the, uh, uh, as Ian McKee said, the genie is out of the bottle. There's nothing you can do about that. Barack Obama made a speech last week explaining that he, as president of the most powerful nation on earth, with every form of uh, um, internet communication device at his hands, could do nothing about the uh, dissemination of the anti-Muslim film. Now, if Barack Obama can't do anything about it, could I respectfully suggest you can't do anything either? He wasn't looking just at you, I think, at the time, Magnus. Uh, there we are. Uh, Matt Roper to be followed by Alan McCloskey, please. Good morning. Thanks a lot for bringing us, asking us on today. Um, I want to pick up on what Stephen was saying, really, that uh, I think when we talk about media in court cases, we're no longer talking about the traditional domestic media only. 
Um, social media and digital media has really, for the first time, placed the means of publication into the hands of the masses. Um, and our contempt laws are not drawn up for a world which blurs the distinction between amateur and professional, national and international media. Um, the media can be the public at large, and the court should not pretend otherwise. Um, I mean, we, if we are going to that length, we might well end up having to send contempt to court advisories or warnings to people, everyone with a Facebook account in Scotland. It's simply not practical. I want to pick up on some of the... I think Amma Amar made some good points about some of the risks attached to televising court. Um, and I think that's, those are all quite well made. But I think the principle that we should try to open up our courts to television cameras is one that we should start with. And if we believe that's a good idea, then it's up to us then to try and work through the practicalities, the safeguards, the guidelines which would protect us. I thought we already had practices in place. I thought Scotland already had practices in place with regard to court proceedings being televised. We do have some, yes, absolutely. Yeah, but, you... but we have had we had a series of experimental cases. Well, obviously, the David Gilroy case, which STV had a successful application in place. But my my contention is, if we are trying to seek to further open up the courts okay. to televising in the way that we've been discussing this morning, perhaps about talking about uh, live court proceedings, high court trials, opposed to sentencing diets then we have to go for a whole set of the guidelines and safety procedures now. But the principle is one which we should address, I think, at this committee and say, yes, we should go down that path. Thank you very much. Alan McCloskey, please. Coming to court from a victims and witnesses perspective is one of the most traumatic things that an individual has to do, um, particularly for a victim who's had emotional, psychological damage as a result of being a victim of crime. To then have to go to a court and relive that is traumatic and is very traumatic. And have the spotlight of the media, potentially part of that circus, adds a different dimension. The ability or the facility to have TV cameras running, particularly in the high profile cases, could in some cases affect evidence and allow for the victim or the witness not to give their best evidence. And that could have an impact on justice. And that's an important point. Thank you. And then, Anwar, you're back in. Um, just taking up the point of, of Alistair, I agree. I, I don't believe that the contempt of court can actually police the internet. Anybody that attempts to in, uh, police social media will find it it's absolutely unmanageable. <coughs> it's an impossible task because of the nature of the beast. The, the issue I'm concerned about is the role of the jury. Um, the, the, the fact remains it's inevitable now that research is going on. Um, in our ordinary lives, if somebody asks us a question and we don't know the answer to it, a lot of people will just simply go onto their iPhone, go onto the internet and search on Google to, to find the answers. So I find it impossible to consider the fact that a juror doesn't go home sometimes and secretly download material to carry out research or inadvertently comes across it or, or simply goes home at six o'clock uh, meets the husband and wife, uh, sees six, uh, you know, Jackie Bird on, on, on BBC News, followed by a teenager coming out of the room and saying, listen, I've heard about that case, this is what I've seen. I mean, this is going on. So the problem, as we see it in the courts at this point in time, is we know it's going on, but there is no research on it. Um, the judge simply gives guidelines at the start of a trial, during the trial, and at the end of the trial, um, and the jury simply told to put these matters that they may have read about out of their minds. Yet, at the, 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 the contradiction is that editors of newspapers can be brought up to trial for contempt of court and being accused of prejudicing um, a right to a fair trial. W which one is it going to be? I really think we've reached the stage now that um, the judge's directions have to be in a language that are severe and unequivocal. And for jurors to realize that if they do take the step of going home and researching and downloading material, and this was to arise, then they could be sent to prison for it. Um, and, and to realize it's as serious as that. It's not a question of policing um, the, the internet, but it is a question of ensuring that the jury system remains what it is, the jewel in the crown of, of um, the Scottish legal system. Ian McKee, you want to come in on that? I'd just like to follow on. I think the jury issue is extremely important, if not the most important issue that we have. And I'm coming at it from a facilitation point of view, as I said, not from a legislating against point of view. I've had occasion recently to look at expert evidence, and it's quite clear to me that in courts, neither judges, prosecution, defence, or juries have a clue what a lot of experts are talking about. And I suspect that we're getting to that stage very quickly with many, many areas as scientific, philosophical, psychological uh, knowledge increases in the world. So I think we've got to look at juries. I, think, I would hope the committee would and the parliament would look at juries. Because if we don't look at juries, 
They are the link, if you like, they are the human link in there between the, the, the legislation and the lawyers and the courts. Unless we do something to assist juries, whether we have juries, whether we have professional <coughs> jurors, which I would favour looking at the idea of professional jurors. Um, we've got to be inventive, with, but juries, to me, are central to the whole issue. You've broadened it really now to the quality of jurors rather than what jurors do. I, um, it, it, yes. You see, I, I've really, I yeah. think jury is a great idea. And in, in Shirley's trial, it was wonderful. But it would not have worried me having professional jurors who knew what they were doing. I'm not talking about professors and people with degrees. I'm talking about the normal run of people. But they're trained, they understand it, they want to do it. I think it should be looked at. It's been done in Asia. I think there are advantages to it. I think there are disadvantages to it. All I'm saying is debate it. Now, if no one else at the moment... Oh, sorry. Donald Finlay, I beg your pardon. Good morning. I wonder if I could just, having listened to the general debate, return to the item on the agenda, which is the role of the media in criminal trials. Uh, it has to be borne in mind, and something this committee is of course concerned with, is we are actually talking about justice. And the whole purpose of a criminal trial is to achieve, as best as we can, justice. And that means affording the citizens of this country who are accused of crime a fair trial in serious matters before a jury of their peers, not professional jurors, as Ian McKee suggests. And, uh, that would be a seismic shift in the way we do business. But a criminal trial takes place on the evidence led in court and according to the law. Uh, and that must be preserved and protected because that's at the very heart of this country, a fair trial system. And the media are, of course, there to broadcast, to cover, to report criminal trials to the wider public. And there's no issue on that at all. But what the media must not be allowed to do is to interfere with the trial process. Now, where interference is beginning to be felt, not may be felt, but is beginning to be felt, is the fact that with these devices, mobile phones, iPads, jurors now can access information about accused persons, about witnesses, about events, and they may rely on that information beyond the evidence led in the trial. And that strikes at the very heart of the trial process, and that is something which must be regulated. Nobody wants to see a juror ending up in prison. Nobody's talking about that. But it has to be made plain to jurors that if they break the rules, if they prejudice a fair trial, then they will run the risk of significant penalty. And the way to avoid doing that is to concentrate on the evidence and not use search engines to find out about people's previous convictions. Similarly, if people want to go and watch a trial. It is a bus ride away. You can go and you can sit there, you can see what happens, you can sit there all day. Uh, and I have to tell you, I'm not in the habit of having to fight my way through the hordes waiting to get in to see a criminal trial. Uh, we don't need any security, we don't need any uh, queuing facilities. Half a dozen people turn up, four of the six will be regulars who visit the High Court every day in life because it is their hobby. So there is no great public clamour. But that's not to say you shouldn't broadcast. I, I'm not against television courts, but I am totally and always will be opposed to television broadcasting a criminal trial. You put pressure on witnesses. It's difficult enough to get people to come forward. You put pressure on the citizen, the accused. If you are acquitted, why should you have your image blasted into every home by the television? People have to make an effort to pick up a newspaper. They have to buy it, they have to get it, they have to read it. Television is put into your home. And if you're an accused person who is then acquitted, your image, minutes of it, perhaps hours of it in a long case, is put into people's homes, and that's very different from a fuzzy image on the front page of a newspaper. Now, people who are convicted or acquitted of serious criminal charges could have their lives at risk because there are people out there who will want to seek vengeance. i make two other quick points. If somebody is acquitted, that is what the justice system has done 
Why should it then be for a television company to put together some kind of package of what it thinks happened in the trial, of what it thinks the evidence amounted to, and show it to the public at large and say, well, this man's been acquitted, but you decide for yourself. You have a go. You try him by television. And that's a very real risk. And, and the last point, again, is about the role of the media. We now have these instant messaging systems where people can actually sit in court with the mobile phone and broadcast the evidence as it is taking place to witnesses who are waiting to give evidence in the same building. And once that information is out there, it's out there, as I understand it, for good. And the people who write what I'm reliably informed are blogs or, or diaries of some kind. You can't find them. You can't locate them. They can put on the internet, this man is on trial today. I say to this jury, he's got 43 previous convictions. He's a villain. He's a rogue. He's a charlatan. He's done this before. It's your job to convict him. And there is apparently to be nothing we can do about it. And the media will shrug their shoulders and say, well, that's just the way it is. There is a crying need for regulation at the hands of this parliament to preserve the justice system that I think is important to us all, much more than the media's ability to cover criminal trials. Thank you. And I think you've provoked some discussion. I've got Magnus Link later, Matt Roper, Alistair Bonington and David Harvey. So. Well, I hesitate to disagree with Donald Findlay, but uh, I can't see his argument uh, that television is materially different from the reporting in the media, in the print media. After all, the summary of a trial in a newspaper is every bit as particular to that newspaper, every bit, it may be every bit as prejudice, may be home in on a particular aspect of the trial, which is not exactly what was intended from the evidence. I can't see that reg well-regulated television coverage of a trial materially alters the basic proposition, which is that any uh, report has to, be, has to be fair, it has to be accurate, it has to be contemporaneous. Uh, that has always been the case. Uh, and I, I, I honestly don't quite understand the argument that television is somehow so much more pernicious in the way it conveys images of a trial uh, that, that that should be uh, disallowed and, and I think those experiments should continue. However, that's one aspect. The far more important aspect is the one that uh, Donald Finley brings up, which is about access to evidence in the course of a trial, either through texting, through Twittering, through all the access to social media that are now available which weren't previously available. I, I think that the, uh, what I would like to just sort of add to that debate, which is at the heart of this one, is the pressure now on newspapers. Newspapers see all this information pouring out through the internet. They see stories running uh, and picked up uh, without any supervision at all. Yet they are expected to operate within a, a certain constraint, a sort of box, if you like, uh, which has not significantly changed. Um, and indeed, every now and again, the law is sort of tightened up when, as in the Bristol case of Joanna Yates, it was an English case, when it seemed to me that the English papers had gradually been pushing the boundaries wider and wider and wider and finally, they were clamped down on in the Joanna Yates case when two newspapers, I think, were finally fined for contempt and they sort of pulled back. <clears throat> Meanwhile, in Scotland, no such latitude, or the, the boundaries have been pushed a bit, but no such latitude had really been observed. And what newspapers find is that um, with this plethora of information coming out, they nevertheless get no, very little help from uh, the Crown Office on the one hand, from the police on the other, who are notoriously restrictive in Scotland, far more restrictive in terms of what newspapers can or can't uh, publish. Uh, there's no real give and take. There's no trust between the two. Uh, and, and so what you've got is a situation where, with this 
barrage of information uh, from which, of course, juries uh, have to be protected, but that, I would submit, is another matter. And newspapers within that expected to operate with the sort of constraints which have always applied. I think in revisiting, the law of contempt in Scotland needs to be revisited with these realities in mind that the communication between newspapers and uh, officers of the law on the one hand and the police on the other need to be reconsidered in that light uh, and, and a new atmosphere of trust built up so that the, the uh, openness and accountability, which Ian McKee mentioned, uh, is a two-way process, that it's not just the case that newspapers are locked in, uh, uh, as it were, uh, as if nothing had happened in the outside world, I think that needs to be addressed by any new assessment of the laws of contempt in Scotland. Thank you. I have a considerable list. I'll just go through it so you know that you're down. Matt Roper, Alistair Bonington, David Harvey, Steve Rayburn, Donald Finlay, then Amar Anwar. So there we are. So you know where you are in the queue. Matt Roper, please. Yeah, I'll just pick up on what Donald Finley was saying there. I mean, just to point on, on regulation, um, obviously broadcasters are already regulated by the Ofcom code and by our own, uh, and by the BBC's case, by its charter. So it's not a case that there is no regulation already. Um, in terms of the, the impact of the image of an of a, of a accused or a, a witness in a case, well, we're just arguing really about whether it moves or whether it's still. You can, you can already have a still photograph and use that after a certain point in evidence. Um, just in terms of, uh, of the immediacy of social media and live reporting, um, I, mean, I can remember as a young reporter in a newspaper, um, in a regional newspaper in England, uh, going on to court and working what they used to call relay reporting, where you'd go in and make your notes in the court case, rush out, phone for the copy for the afternoon deadline, it would come out in the evening's paper. And really the only difference between that kind of reporting and social media reporting is that it's just a delay. And currently, of course, anyone sitting in a court can take down notes, walk outside the precincts of the court, and post a message, a blog, whatever it might be already. So really, all we are, since we're looking at, is the difference between uh, a period of time between it, we're basically privileging the person who is outside of court over the person who is in court. So actually, in some ways, we're always talking it's about delay pressure. Um, thank you. Alistair Bonington, please. Thank you. Um, quite understandably, Donald Finley looks at this from the perspective of the accused person, but, but could I suggest there is a wider interest in a criminal trial, and that's the public interest in a criminal trial. After all, we pay for everything that happens, the judge, the defence lawyer, the Crown, etc., etc., and we do have a right to know what's going on. Um, he particularly mentioned that uh, the TV after an acquittal wouldn't uh, be doing their job properly, as I understood it, and Donald will correct me if I've picked this up wrongly, if they then speculated as to another explanation from that that the jury found to be the case. Well, that surely is just an aspect of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, it should never be forgotten, is just what it says. It's not freedom of nice middle class speech. It's not freedom for victim orientated speech. It's just free speech. Now, our two best judges of the age, Lords Hope and Roger, in the Channel 4 submission, if you've read it, specifically mention the fact that there should be no control over the methodology of communication. Free speech allows methodology such as tabloids, which personally I find revolting, uh, but that's me. Uh, I have no right to prevent tabloids reporting in the way that they do. Um, it seems to me uh, that we just have to live with that if we live with free speech. When we get into qualitative judgments, we're sunk. We're actually not in favour of free speech anymore. And frankly, the UK's position on free speech is bad enough as it is. Uh, as Magnus has said, contempt is certainly much more strict and always has been much more strict than for the rest of the UK. And in European terms, we're in the Jurassic Age. Colourful as ever. Uh, David Harvey, please. Uh, good morning. Um, I agree with uh, Mr Finlay to the extent the overriding principle um, is the proper administration of justice, and I think um, that's uh, what all speakers are, are saying in terms of, of, of being key, that no matter what uh, the, the freedoms are in terms of balancing with, with uh, uh, media reporting, etc., the, the key is that the, the proper administration of justice must be uh, uh, preserved. There's a, a 
characterise it as there's a, a fine tradition of, of reporting the criminal justice system in Scotland with politics and sport, events and the courts dominate. Um, the, the press and the broadcast media and experienced court reporters and editors have a sound grasp of the balance, as Mr Rayburn indicated, between uh, the freedom to report and the potential prejudice to proceedings. Um, and the 81 Act and, and the common law have tried to reflect that with, with the test that's in place, which is, is, reflects uh, serious prejudice uh, to the proceedings. So the, the test is actually, uh, uh, as it stands at the moment, fairly high. Um, there is no plague of, of um, uh, reporters being um, uh, brought before their courts uh, for or criminal sanction. Um, unrestrained and irresponsible reporting can impact adversely on proceedings, and we have had that um, um, indeed um, uh, recently as well. Um, but it is um, by exception. Um, and the judiciary are rightly left at the moment as the arbiters uh, responsible for securing the fairness of the proceedings. They can investigate and they can protect the fairness of those proceedings. And um, in cases where, well, as I said, we have had cases where uh, proceedings have been halted. Um, the Crown's um, view is, is, is the majority, of, if not all, of, of these matters can be uh, cured by a, a jury direction. And the defence can help um, in, inform that. And, and as things stand at the moment, um, there is a, a flexibility in, in the legal system in Scotland that the defence can make representations to the court, I think as Mr Bonington indicated as well, um, if, if they perceive that there is, is any unfairness um, or whether there is any risk to the proceedings. Um, and and that, that's a, a helpful check and balance, um, unlike in other jurisdictions where certain directions are, are, are arbitrary. And indeed, there's a risk in directions being arbitrary because actually that may seek to highlight something um, uh, to jurors that wouldn't otherwise have crossed their mind in the particular circumstances of the case. So there is an advantage in that uh, flexibility, I would suggest. The, the, the helpful uh, briefing note uh, circulated to, to members in advance of the debate refer made reference to Crown um, operational notes. And I think it's helpful just to capture um, the extent to which those are used. Those of, um, are, who are in the media and who have advised on these matters will be more familiar, but, but for others, um, they are actually a, a commonplace occurrence. And, and the key um, uh, use for these is actually to indicate um, uh, to those who, who may seek to, to report on these matters when the various triggers um, uh, for proceedings have, have kicked in so that the, there is that, that help there. Um, in terms of, of, of some of the examples that have been quoted, and I'm conscious that the, 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 the McLean example and, and others, that, that, that some of these are, are relatively historic, we have had um, some changes. Um, in, in um, recent years and indeed within the last year or two, um, which, which have been helpful, have been helpful um, uh, challenges in the courts um, uh, by uh, some media outlets to try and clarify some of these issues. And, and that has prompted, I think, um, a, it would be fair to say, some a, a greater uh, clarification, not only as you're perhaps aware from uh, the, the Lord President's practice note in relation to uh, a, a broadcast media accessing uh, a court proceedings, but separately, there, there is now um, a, a far uh, greater and more coherent um, a, a protocol in place with the media in terms of access to productions, early access to productions, um, and indeed there's, a, there's a, an agreed protocol. Um, I think the point of, of um, non-traditional uh, you know, the, the, the non media, for want of a better phrase, the bloggers, etc., in terms of guidance that might be available to them, again, there might be an issue in terms of the profile of this document, and that's something that, that, that might be worthy of taking away. But there is guidance in, in, in this protocol for those um, who are not part of what would traditionally have been described as the mainstream media about the types of situation where um, these uh, uh, contempt issues might arise and the types of places that they can go for guidance from that. And that includes um, not only ourselves, but the court service and indeed uh, where appropriate contact uh, with the defence. Um, the, um, there's a careful balance um, required uh, there's, there's, uh, between um, uh, Article 10 and the common law and, 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 and open justice and the potential prejudice to proceedings. And, and I would counsel uh, care uh, for the committee in contemplating any legislation that might uh, seek to restrict um, uh, uh, reporting in any way and, and, and seek to restrict um, the open justice. Um, give you some comfort. We don't have legislation on the mind at the moment, that, that, neither do we have the space. That, that, that's but I'm helpful. interested in the protocol that you refer to, and perhaps later, if you could advise the clerks where we would see this, and it's, we it's haven't had sight of that. It's published on our internet. But I, I, well, I'm there sure we go. Good available. old internet. Indeed. It has some pluses, yes. 
Sorry. Sorry. Please. Um, the, uh, I, th I think that finally dealing with um, uh, TV in the courts, um, uh, we have, um, has been uh, referred to earlier, some experience in, in, in dealing with um, uh, some of uh, the applications in relation to uh, the permissions that have been in place since 1992. Um, it is fair to say that, that when um, contact is made initially with, with, with victims and, and witnesses, in general, the, the, the response is, is, is usually negative. Um, there, there is not a, um, an eagerness to, to, to have um, uh, themselves broadcast, given all of the, the other pressures which they face. Um, and insofar as, as the, the, the media interest in these matters, I think that echoing Mr Finlay's comments about uh, those who are um, um, uh, present in the, in the public galleries. It's certainly my experience that um, that's directly related to, to the profile of the accused and or um, a witness, potentially victim. Um, and I think that, that certainly in, in the BBC submission that that's acknowledged that there is likely to be um, a greater interest um, in, in televising those matters which are regarded as um, high profile for want of a better phrase. Those individuals, I would just remind everyone, are equally entitled to fair proceedings. Um, and, and there's, a, there's a, a helpful line of, of, of um, authority in relation to that. Um, it should not be seen that someone, simply because they are a well-kent face, um, suddenly uh, loses any of the, the protections, in particular in relation to whether they're an <coughs> accused person. Identification still can be an issue, whether or not we regard them as a publicly known face. They may not be publicly known or recognised as um, uh, by the, the, the key witnesses in the case, and that is absolutely essential um, when uh, testing uh, the, um, the, the truth or otherwise of a witness's evidence that um, that is uh, uh, properly gauged in light of their recollection and not um, uh, tainted in any way by, by anything which um, uh, others may perceive as the, their position. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, I've got Steve Rayburn followed by Donald Finlay, Amar Anwar, John Cadahy and Ian McKee. Steve Rayburn, please. Um, <clears throat> the starting point in all of this, I think, has to be the presumption that the, the workings of the court, the functions of the court, uh, whilst we want to observe all the correct protections for victims and so on, they're, they're not operated for victims or for any particular interest group. They're for the public interest and the public interest has to be fully served. I would argue that the public interest is best served by um, exposing the courts to as much public scrutiny as is possible. I don't see for a second any reason why the experience of attending court cannot be simulated warts and all with the presence of strategically placed, carefully placed cameras that would not impinge on um, the witnesses, for example, and the examples that we've seen so far, the sentence advisings and so on, the live proceedings, have been very careful with the cameras have been placed, and that's been very effective. Um, if there's a, a question of um, a juror anxiety, um, I suspect that that anxiety may well be um, may well be uh, localised, if that's the best way to put it. If you're concerned about you know, local reprisals and so on, the people that are concerned will be there in any event. Um, if you're broadening it out to the wider public interest, uh, I'm not sure that would necessarily uh, have any additional impact on victims. It wouldn't already be in place anyway. We're talking about supplementing the problem. I'm not sure that broadcasting would create any new issues there, provided it was handled sensibly. The model to look at number of models to look at. I mean, these proceedings are televised right here and now. Um, there's not a lot of people here, but I suspect there'll be a lot of people in the wider public that would have some interest in what's being discussed today. <clears throat> and I think that's an example to follow. BBC Parliament has an example to follow. It runs debates as often as Parliament sits late into the night, probably to a limited audience, but it's a dedicated audience that are interested. It's our Parliament. We're entitled to see it. It's Hollywood television, there's Democracy Live. Uh, all these things are available to stream online. And in no way do they impinge upon the integrity of the proceedings themselves. And of course, that has to be the only consideration is that the integrity of the proceedings themselves affected. If there's a risk of that, then you can't do it. But I would argue that there's no reason why the proceedings cannot proceed without that risk. Um, to touch very briefly on the issue of um, uh, social media and so on, at the moment, the, the use of, of Twitter and uh, external communication devices is restrained. You cannot do it without the special permission of the presiding judge. So essentially, it doesn't really happen. It has happened uh, in the odd occasion recently. I think the most recently was the Thomas Sheridan sentencing. Um, and that 
was principally because of the, the need for urgency the broadcasters felt for a quick response. Perhaps in a sentencing, when there's only a matter of fact, guilt or innocence to be uh, transmitted to the public, that could be used far more widely. Uh, if there's a risk of um, unfiltered use of Twitter for any member of the public, then it the, harks back to the point I made a few minutes ago that the members of the public who are not trained in the restraints of the Contempt of Court Act cannot be expected to know the damage they're doing. So, therefore, th that type of use would need to be restrained amongst those that were aware of the Contempt of Court provisions, that you can't be selective in what you mention, uh, contemporaneous reporting and so on. You have to be thorough, even-handed and clear. Um, on the point of, um, and Matt made this point, that anybody in the moment can attend the court, leave, with a careful note of what they wrote down in their own hand, and then post that on the internet. There's no restraint on this. Uh, that is subject to the Contempt of Court Act. Uh, the Act itself, as I mentioned, is, um, I think, perfectly adequate in terms of print and broadcast. Uh, I think it's beyond useless when it comes to the internet if you're not having um, the access of the material restrained by people that are trained in the Act. So, to look at a, a, a very effective blog that ran during the Thomas Sheridan trial again, and, and it was done by a fellow who sat in the court, wrote it out in his own hand, and then posted it online. And it was very clear, very methodical. It happened to be very diligent, and that was down to him. But it left uh, actually a very useful and a very valuable uh, record that was not replicated in the mainstream or any really of the other um, <clears throat> reports of that case. Because even online, um, uh, and I am certainly uh, in the same boat when I publish anything online, you abide by the broadcast and the print conventions. A headline, the substance of the story, the essential detail, and then you stop. Uh, and it's constrained in length. Uh, a blog is not constrained in length. And it tends to be much more um, methodical, much more linear, uh, much more um, likely to follow the sequence of events. And it could run for pages and pages and pages. <clears throat> That could be extremely valuable if it's properly if it's properly regulated. There's a, there's a, a useful um, uh, a useful facility there. The final point I want to make about <coughs> cameras in court, as I do think it would actually add greatly, very very greatly, to the administration of justice. By this, I'm referring specifically to so many of the the, uh, the fundamentals of our law, which have very recently been eroded and destroyed. Uh, we're talking now about, of course, um, the removal of corroboration, which is on the cards. We've already uh, introduced um, the so-called double jeopardy, the multiple trials rule. Uh, there's talk now of the disclosure of prior convictions and so on. These are not small matters. These are utterly fundamental, and they've, they've massively, massively degraded our justice system. And turned I don't it want to get into those other issues just now. Sure. I mean, could we just keep it to the subject sure. in hand, please? Well, that, that, does, that does speak specifically to the point, which is simply this. Um, with additional eyes on the procedures, with additional scrutiny, with additional visibility from interested members of the public, perhaps interested members of the media that don't have the resource to attend, uh, there's a far greater um, likelihood that the, the actings within the court will, um, uh, will set greater serve the interests of justice. And one particular reason, um, I spoke to uh, a colleague in criminal uh, defence, and of course we've got learning counsel here, and of course Mr. Amar, who are far more directly experienced in this than I, but they may be able to speak to this point. That um, there are this, this person I spoke to in 20 years of, uh, of trial work had never once been involved in a case where anybody had been uh, charged with perjury. When it was quite clear through the course of the proceedings that perjury had been committed, uh, and if there was more visibility on that. Uh, there's probably more chance that people's evidence would speak closer to the facts and that people would perhaps question, well, why was that person not then charged with perjury because it was clearly they were lying? If you have more eyes on it, more visibility, more scrutiny, this is the type of scrutiny that can improve the administration of justice. And that, in my view, firmly is what ought to be encouraged. Well, appropriately, you're now followed by Donald Finlay, then Amar Anwar, no doubt, will pick up these points. Mr Finlay. I'm sorry to begin by taking issue with, with an old friend, Magnus, and, and a distinguished newspaper man. But, but he, he, with respect, he's defending the indefensible and in, in, in living in the past. To say that there's no difference between a newspaper and television, come on, Magnus, please. You read something. Today in Afghanistan, a suicide bomber killed four people and did this. And you put on an image of where a bomb has gone off and you see blood and destruction on a television say, you tell me that there's no difference in impact. 
Of course, there's a huge difference in impact. You can actually see it for yourself. So you, you can't make that comparison. Just, just, just a matter of degree, respond. Donald. It's, it's a, of, course, of course there is a difference, but it's a, it's a matter of degree, not of actual substance. But substance and degree are, are one and the same thing. You read a report of something that happens in a criminal trial. It's covered. It's there. But when you actually take it into somebody's home, and, and if I can ally that to what Alistair was saying, I agree with him entirely about freedom of speech. Of course I do. I happen to think that there's a real danger that parliaments generally are imposing far too many restrictions on freedom of speech. I'm a great believer in resisting the power of the state at every opportunity, but it is a balancing act. And if you are talking about a criminal trial being a trial on the evidence led in court according to the law, if you want to change that, then blast it apart, change the whole system. But don't pretend that you can ignore that central core. Oh, you're talking about the American model. Do we really want to go down that route and have the trial played out before the cameras, before it starts, where the prosecution say this, the defence say that? If there's freedom of speech, then during a criminal trial, why don't we have a reporter coming out in front of the High Court in Edinburgh and saying, well, that was a bad day for the defence today in court number three. Four witnesses identified the accused. You could see that the jury are with the prosecution in this case. That's your freedom of speech. But it's driving a coach and four through the fundamental trial principle. And the same applies to Parliament. Stephen's point, yes, broadcast parliaments. We broadcast parliaments. Freedom of speech, we are entitled to know. Broadcast a cabinet meeting. Let's see what they actually are deciding and how they are going about it. Never mind the public debate. Broadcast the cabinet meetings. Broadcast all the private meetings where the decisions are taken. We are the public. We are entitled to know. So it, it is really about principle. And it is getting that balance right. And I don't know who Stephen was talking to, uh, not somebody who was that much involved in the High Court for 20 years if they'd never known anybody being convicted of perjury. I've known people being convicted of perjury, sent to jail for perjury. I've defended a number of people uh, for having committed perjury in High Court trials. So you don't need the television cameras for that. It, it is about striking a balance. Uh, and... Nothing will convince me otherwise, and I will debate it anywhere, anytime, that we have a system whereby a trial is just that. It's a test of the evidence in court, and that is the aspect that must be protected. And how we look at the role of the media is against that particular background. I could just reply to one thing. Uh, I say to Ian McKee, with the greatest of respect, uh, some of us who do play our trade in court do know a fair bit about what expert witnesses are talking about. I mean, we, we, managed, we managed to stumble along. The emphasis is in some. <laughs> can, can I just say, uh, can I say, uh, Lauren Finney, then, is your position there should be no television in courts at all, not even the very limited that we've had so far on the experimental basis? I, I'm sorry, if you don't have made my position that plain, I do apologise. I have no difficulty, for example, as, as Amir Anwar has said, with uh, criminal appeals being covered. Mm -hmm. I, there was a, a case recently where a judge was filmed passing sentence. I, I, I have no difficulty with that. But I, I do have an absolute uh, difficulty with the problems and the risk to justice of the broadcasting of television, uh, uh, broadcasting of criminal trials and <coughs> television. And even with the greatest of respect to my broadcasting colleagues and taking an elemosynary view of their approach, they are concerned only with what they are doing, not with the interests of justice at the end of the day. Thank you for that. No doubt we'll come back in. Anwar Anwar, then John Cadahy, then Ian McKee, then Alistair Bonington. I agree with everything that uh, Donald has said there and taking up on what Magnus said. 
Um, I do agree on one level that we, we do need to bring the present contempt of law into the 21st century. There's no point in going along with a law which is 1981. Uh, and secondly, that the judges also need to embrace the fact that there is advances in technology and we need to, to get up to speed with it, which means that we do, do need to review now in the courts exactly what was going on because it does seem to be a contradiction. And Stephen and others are right that um, whilst you, you can't tweet in court, you could then go outside and put it onto your email and, and, and send the, the material straight away. But, but picking up on the issue of the print media and the TV media and saying that we already have them in court, I do, I'm not one of those that actually thinks that the print media and the TV media are to be congratulated for what they do in the court process at the moment. It's incredibly frustrating sitting in a tile day in, day out, and all you see at the end of a day is a two-minute soundbite, whether it be on TV um, and it's usually weighted in the favour of the Crown, um, um, it doesn't reflect what's happened over the course of the day. It will absolutely have an impact on the juror when they go home to their wife, their husband or their family who say, oh, surely you're going to find that person guilty. It was all over the news. Or to pick up a newspaper the next day and headlines are printed in quotes in certain high-profile trials, trials that I've seen that have been ongoing and prior to the trial where there's been a mass of prejudicial publicity. But judges in this country have been unwilling to desert the trial um, prior to it starting because they said they will simply direct the jury to put those millions of internet hits um, out of their mind. And, and the fact remains that, yes, there is pressure on um, the print media and on TV, uh, Magnus, and it's this, that they are losing readers by the hundreds of thousands. There is, a there is a pressure to compete and to succeed. Um, that means in telling advertising space, and which means it comes down to this. It's a question of prime time TV. It means sensationalizing it in the same way that we had within the United States, the sensationalizing of court trials, the most notorious case being that of O.J. Simpson. And it's, it's, it's no coincidence that since O.J. Simpson, there's been less televising of court trials in, in, in the United States. And the question raised uh, by, by, by Stephen about the blogger, it was James Dolman who blogged during the Sheridan trial. Again, that was um, an excellent piece of blogging that were done, but we were lucky in one stage that it was one blogger, that he was conscientious, that he wrote down exactly everything that happened during the court trial, but what was frustrating was this, that what if it had been somebody else who wasn't? What about when a blog is placed out there on the internet and it invites opinion? There is no way of combating that opinion. Once that opinion's on and everybody starts writing their opinion on the internet, it's out there. What's to stop a jury coming over that inadvertently or um, overtly? And secondly, it again reflects the, the frustrations as, as criminal lawyers that we have that the, the media is incredibly pressed has pressure on resources, that they are unable to have a journalist sit there through the whole course of the day and to report the, the, the plus and the negative, the defence um, and the crown and what they reduce to is um, sound doubt culture. And the question of Twitter, it was used um, in, in the Sheridan trial and I remember it was used during the, the sentencing. I had no problem with it, but I have to raise the question that when I did look at some of what was said on Twitter during the, the, the day of um, waiting, I think it was for, for whether the jury found Mr Sheridan guilty or not guilty, I really didn't see what purpose it served. I think it was the BBC talking about whether defence solicitors or others were looking grey-faced or looking troubled or looking worried. What exactly did that have to do with um, the jury coming back and, and delivering the verdict? And, and with regards to Alistair, and I agree absolutely with um, Donald on this, uh, Alistair, free speech does not just always just mean free speech, free speech. Free speech in this country and in Europe carries responsibilities. And that free speech the right of Article 10 has to be balanced with the right to a fair trial. Right to fair trial, Article 6. Um, and we can talk about the United States uh, because the United States values its free speech. It has a First Amendment which values its speech, yet it also has other safeguards such as jury vetting, which ensure the right to a fair trial. We do not have jury vetting within this country, which is why the contempt of court is essential, which is why it needs to be extended, and it needs to be rigorously updated to take account of, um, of technological advantages. Otherwise, what we are going to have is get the cameras in there, and with the greatest of respect for the media saying that we have genuine interest, your genuine interest is not concern for justice. Your genuine interest is simply of getting cameras in there, and what we'll do is open the floodgates and Hollywoodization of our courts, and that's unacceptable. Thank you for that, John Cuddy, Ian McKee. John Cuddy, who first, then Ian McKee. Thank you, Kim Um I think it's uh, quite interesting to note that the agenda item is the role of media within criminal trials. But after the discussion that's ongoing, I wonder if it's more appropriate for it to be the impact and implications of media within criminal trials. 
I think that's what we mean. Mm. Perhaps we um, should take lessons on how to okay. head up our agenda. In, certainly in general, it's the view of ACPOS that the police are charged with the preservation of life, the protection of property and the bringing of offenders um, to justice by enforcing the law. Um, and so doing, identify the crimes, the victims, witnesses and accused. When the due process of law results in judicial proceedings, we must ensure that such victims, witnesses and their families are protected from the fear of intimidation and influence, perceived or otherwise, and that they are free to give evidence without any undue pressure being influenced upon them, which may result and a compromise to the integrity of the evidence, to the trial and justice. It is our experience, and certainly in my own experience, that in most cases, members of the public are extremely reluctant to come forward and to provide witness testimony, particularly in the most serious of crimes. Whilst ACPOS welcomes the debate on judicial transparency, we must be careful that our attempts to show that justice is seen to be done we must maintain the principle that justice is actually done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Ian McKee, followed by Alistair Bonington, please. Thanks, Yvina. I would just like to respond to Mr Finlay that uh, his expertise is acknowledged and certainly in fingerprints, and it was a master class at my daughter's uh, trial. Unfortunately, I don't believe that many of his colleagues could have followed him, but that's an aside, absolutely. Um, I have a great sympathy with many of the things that are said today, and, I, and again, particularly with what uh, Mr Finlay says about justice, uh, and you say yourself about justice, it's absolutely paramount, and what you say about <coughs> victims and the feelings they go to court. But the fact of the matter is, we, we're going to have to get to grips with this, not only in Scotland, this is an international issue. I mean, there's a lot written on the internet on this whole issue internationally, and it seems to me we can't sit with our head and buried in the sand and look at the situation in Scotland. We look, need to look beyond our, our, our shores. What's coming here is we're actually asking judges to be gatekeepers of a lot of things, not only expert evidence. We're asking them to be gatekeepers of the media, if you like, the social media. And I just quite think, quite frankly, that's impossible. So we need to find a way of assisting the courts in the handling of this whole thing. Judges are not gatekeepers. There's an arrogance, I believe, about in the judiciary that, in fact, they can do everything. They can't do everything. Things have moved on since the last century, and we really need to come to grips with that. Um, I believe we need training, particularly in the court system of the judiciary, of lawyers, and possibly of jurors. Training and communication are two of the major things. And if we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at solutions, then we've got to look at things like training. How do we get the courts to truly gatekeep this, and not this fiction, in fact, that they can do it? Thank you very much. Alistair Bonington, then Steve Rayburn, then Matt Roper. Thank you. I, I would just want to point out that um, there is a danger that we proceed on the basis that something which to us, uh, exercising one would hope a reasonable degree of common sense, would seem to be prejudicial, actually doesn't have a prejudicial effect in a jury. You're not allowed to do any research in the UK. It's illegal. It's a crime. So we don't have any research. Uh, Lord Hope pointed out quite rightly in the Chokar case, HMA against Montgomery and Coulter, that there is research in New Zealand, where I was teaching this year, teaching media law this year, so I was talking to the academics there about it. It's very interesting, but basically, what it appears to be, so far as research has been done in a society that's very similar to our own, is that the jury become what well, I think, Mr Friendly will correct me if I'm wrong, if some lawyers call a mini-parliament, they become part of a little society that meets together to try and accuse person. And the last thing you can do, as you and I remember, Donald, Sheriff Irvin Smith tried to tell everybody that uh, the man in the dock was guilty of sin, and the jury regularly said quite rude words privately, and they acquitted him. And I'm sure you benefited from that, as I did, uh, when we were both a lot younger than we are now. Now, in, so in fact, let us not proceed on the basis that something in the front of the sun, saying this man has 45 convictions, big arrow, guilty man, you know, hang him. You're not allowed to do that, as we know. But let's say you were allowed to do that. Will that lead to his conviction? Don't think it will. There is no research to justify that conclusion. And in X against Sweeney, the Glasgow rape case, where my firm was involved, I was with Ross Harper doing criminal work at the time, and we did the private prosecution of the accused persons. You may remember the case. Uh, and in fact, despite all the advanced publicity, which basically said these are guilty sods and should be hung, drawn and quartered at best, 
there was still, as the court pointed out, a discerning verdict brought in. Can I just lastly say, I do not understand the idea of updating the 1981 Act. The 1981 Act was in response to, as I've said, the European Court of Human Rights decision in the Sunday Let's Times Thalidomide case. It therefore has the imprimatur of European law. There are certain problems with it. There were promises given to Europe uh, about what we would do, and Scotland failed to do it. England didn't, but Scotland did. That's in relation to appeals and right to be heard. Uh, but let, setting that aside, the Act is something that judges have got a wide canvas on which to play. This is the kind of thing that has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis by experienced judges. We don't need any more legislation. The last thing you want is to update legislation and put in stuff about Twitter, and then somebody invents something called Twongle or something like that, and you know, cover Twongle, because it was Twitter. So you don't do that. Stick where you are. You've got enough weapons in the hands of the judiciary. Thank you for that. And Steve Rayburn, which is a very good place for you to come in now. <coughs> and uh, um, Matt Roper, Magnus Link later, Amar Anwar. And then what I'm going to ask committee members who've uh, listened if they want to ask any questions. And just to let you cogitate, committee members, we haven't touched on filming witnesses arriving and leaving court. We haven't touched on newspaper commentary on witnesses' character. And we haven't touched really very much on police in the media during and after trials and come out and make some kind of statement to the press during the course of the, We might want to touch on those at some point if they're not addressed <coughs> by the following uh, people. So Matt Roper, Magnus Leitler, Anwar Anwar, and then committee members. Steve um, Rayburn. <coughs> the issue um, of whether the law has to be updated to uh, account for social media, uh, I don't think it's something that can be, that can be avoided. Um, the reason for that is just simply that as the, as the Ryan Giggs episode has proven, and indeed many others, um, whilst the judiciary, of course, do have wide discretion to apply the existing law, it's very, very hard to do that when uh, the people that are potentially flouting that law are, are utterly invisible and anonymous, and therefore the law may not be able to reach them in its present form. So that, that's certainly an issue. Um, <clears throat> an example, I think, which is extremely useful, and this touches on the issue of, of, of blogging and basically turning members of the public into broadcasters and into journalists, into editors, which is what the technology currently permits them to do. There's really no restraint on that. And uh, as Amar mentioned, the, the blog, uh, as I mentioned as well, that was uh, widely read during the Sheridan case uh, happened to be extremely well written, carefully written by somebody who was mindful of um, the, the contempt of court provisions. They could just as easily not have been. Uh, now, the argument there is that the contempt of court act perhaps could have caught that individual uh, because it was quite trackable and accessible and open about who he was, um, but it may not have been. So you have a, 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 a removed problem there, is how do you reach people that are um, uh, able to be completely anonymous? And in the case of the Ryan Giggs instance, where um, there was a, a court restriction on identifying certain individuals, um, all across England where the law applied, people left, right and centre were using the social media and just transmitting these names across and there was little explosions going on all over the internet. People were mentioning this name all over the place. And I would argue beyond the reach of the law. So the, the law has to factor into it that this is now possible, <clears throat> regardless of what the technology is named. And what it, the, the, the fundamental difference is that members of the public now have the power of an editor and a broadcaster which they never had before. And uh, editors and broadcasters, when the act was written, were trained. Uh, and that's what the act was uh, uh, taken to account for, that they understood what the restraints were, and we can't presume the public have that. Um, I, I, I don't see how the objection that was raised earlier on, that uh, having cameras in court or any kind of coverage, necessarily equates to having um, uh, a sound bite breakdown or a package. Um, what I think is, uh, what I was in favour of, and I'm in favour of, is broadcasting court proceedings <laughs> as they transpire. Uh, and that's a completely different thing from taking something at the end of the day and breaking it down into a broadcast package, which, of course, necessi necessitates editing and some selection and cherry-picking, prioritising, and that's, uh, again, something that has to be done with immense care. But that is currently what's getting done at the moment um, just without cameras. It's getting done uh, with the material available to court reporters, and the law at the moment is perfectly adequate to deal with that. So... Um, if there's going to be packaging uh, of the same material with the addition of images, then you'd need to apply the same, the same rigour. But uh, that in itself, I don't think, necessarily presents a problem. 
Um, but I do think that um, when you're editing a visual package, it just has that tendency to, to, to risk highlighting on things that are a bit more colourful. Uh, and but that it, it does not. It's a completely separate issue from broadcasting the court proceedings as they happen. Uh, and that is the bit which I believe would actually enhance and greatly improve the administration of justice. I accept that some uh, objections have been raised about possible risks, risks to uh, a witness's willingness to speak and so on. Um, I'm not entirely um, satisfied that those risks outweigh the public interest in bringing the broadcasting of the proceedings themselves. But to take that aside from an edited package, which is completely different, and I'm sure many of the people around this table will be aware um, of a long-standing Channel 4 effort to do just that um, after the fact of a completed trial. And um, again, but the, the, by that time, justice will have been served. But you're looking at a different uh, <laughs> possibility there because, of course, that person will serve their time if the proceedings end, and then you've got something on an archive and a whole different set of issues there. These are not related to the need to broadcast the proceedings as they take place. And to use perhaps the worst excess of television that there exists is the Big Brother example, but the Big Brother example is very informative and instructive. You recollect um, that George Galloway took place in that, in that program, and I remember reading in one of the newspapers at the time, ahead of his appearance, he said specifically what he wanted to do was to use the platform of the program to um, somehow uh, espouse some views politically. But of course that's contrary to Ofcom regulations. And not a word of what he felt politically found its way into that programming, and that was across three weeks, three weeks of live broadcasting. They're not delayed transmission. Not, I'm not yes. confessing to watching it. Yes. This is what I've been told, but was it not delayed transmission for that reason? Are you indeed. suggesting that in court proceedings? Well, indeed, that brings me precisely to the safeguards that can very easily be introduced. Uh, as a safeguard like that um, demonstrates that it can be done. Uh, there's you know, perhaps uh, other issues uh, about the... Um, uh, the immediacy of the uh, of the proceedings in court, and then of course the the, the judge may say, well, this uh, um, evidence must be heard in, in private, perhaps clear the court. There's no reason why the transmission can't just cease. You blank screen it. We're not talking about entertainment. We're talking about public service. There's no reason why the proceedings can't be blank screened. We're not looking to um, to come to the final point. I think it was Amar had mentioned it about it being like a prime time uh, issue. If it's live broadcasting, there's no prime time. It's the end of court shuts at four. It stops at four. There's no prime time. There's no selection uh, into, um, to, to compete with uh, the evening's entertainment or broadcasting, which is a completely different purpose. I don't think the audience of a, you know, 8 o'clock on a Thursday night is the same audience at 2 o'clock in the afternoon that may have an interest in the administration of justice. The, the two things just don't connect, I think. There's a red button. You can replay it later, can you? I think there's a red button. You can look at things later. I'm not very technological, so you Again, could, these are possibilities, fact... yeah. The, the, the broadcasters can facilitate an awful lot of possibilities. But then if the, if the court are concerned about that, about the contemporaneous issue of it, again, my, my, my um, belief is that it's, a, it's the replication of the live experience of attending court, which the, the, the technology now exists to, to, to replicate. And now, the, the audience that are attending court in person don't have the red button facility, so perhaps when it comes to the administration of justice, um, uh, there's no reason why that has to be provided for people that are watching it live. Why should you be able to have another look at something that was said? Safeguards can, I mean, there's enough brilliant minds in television that could easily get around these specific details. The principle of facilitating live broadcasting from court in a sensitive way that does not interfere with the administration of justice is very hard to defeat, and I don't really believe there's a sustainable argument anymore. I, I think your point's clear. I'm going to. I'm trying to watch time, and mindful we've had quite a long session. I will give everybody an opportunity to think they've missed something. Uh, I think if they want to write to us, because I'm, I'm going to let committee members in at some point. Um, you are guessing. I mean, I know you're itching. Matt Roper, minus link later. Amar Anwar, then committee members. So you better start indicating now if you want to ask a question. Right. Um, it's no, Matt. please, Matt Roper. I think just picking up what Stephen was saying there and uh, answering a little bit what Emma Anwar was saying there, the, the special status of TV is already recognised in our law. We have Ofcom regulation. You know, it's a privilege to be able to go into people's, into people's front rooms. Um, television journalists as well, I think, are probably a better place than anyone to understand the perils of live reporting. It's something which we do all the time. Um, and I don't think there's any question, there's any chance, there's any Hollywoodization of... It simply couldn't happen in this country in the, under the current laws. Um, I think it's interesting, though, that picking up on really any, I haven't heard any objections at all so far to televising of appeals and sentencings, which is interesting because obviously 
they're very, they're very rare, if ever. Um, so I'd be interested to see where we can progress uh, you know, after this committee to actually see where some of these things actually might come to fruition now. Um, um, and I think as well, just on terms of social media, we uh, recognise it's, it's a risky business um, and we have uh, our own codes and guidelines which we follow to rule our journalists to make sure that it is not something which is done lightly. Um, I think you know, the use of social media in court does raise the raise, increases the risks, um, but there are ways with proper training uh, that those risks can be mitigated. Thank you very much. Magnus Link later. <coughs> I relish uh, being accused by Donald Finlay of being locked in the past because I don't understand the, in, the impact of television. But may I say that I think you are, um, that there's a, a confusion here, dare I say it, in both what Amar Anwar and Donald Finlay have said about the impact of television. We shouldn't probably get too, too bogged down in, in this specific argument, but Donald is making the point that television has an impact which the print media doesn't have, and therefore that impact is likely to lead to a greater prejudice than uh, the uh, situation at present when, where the print media on the whole dominate. Amma actually complains that the media are very bad at reporting trials, and hands up, I'm sure we are. I'm sure we both reduce complex argument to simplicities, we reduce uh, what must be seen by you in the course of a day as being a highly significant exchange of information, and you pick up the paper and there's a story on page 94, and, and that is very unsatisfactory. But these are two entirely different arguments. <clears throat> Actually, continuous TV streaming of a trial would answer Amar Anwar's case absolutely right away. They would have the, the ability to follow a trial all the way through a day. The packaging that Donald complains of at the end of the day with a reporter standing in front and giving a wholly prejudicial account of the trial would be presumably covered by a contempt of court and, and, uh, and, and rules would, be, would, would govern that just in the same way that they govern the media today. So I think these are two completely different arguments and, and I can't, I still can't grasp, um, despite being locked in the past, I can't grasp um, Donald's, Donald's uh, objection uh, to, to television. And finally, just one point, uh, it, it, it all, as, as Ian McKee rightly says, it comes down to the jury, the way that a jury is instructed. I don't actually understand your, your point about judges are not gatekeepers. If judges are not gatekeepers, what on earth are they? They are the ones who instruct a jury. They are the ones who say you must ignore this, that, and the other. They are in a very, very important position. And I rather like, it was, I think, um, Lord, the Lord Prosser who once said, addressing this point, uh, juries are healthy bodies. They do not need a germ-free atmosphere. Now, that may be more the case today, there may be greater risks today, but I still think that remains the case, that a jury is there listening to a day's proceedings and, and is far more likely to be influenced by what they've heard during that day in court than they are picking up the newspaper and reading the very unsatisfactory report, uh, or indeed even um, uh, the... Um, the account they may get from their family of a, of a TV report at the end of the day. Uh, can I just ask you briefly, um, Anwar, to do to, the last one, this then should get members. Just coming back um, in response to Stephen, I, I'm all for public scrutiny of, of the judiciary, of the courts, um, of the police and of the Crown Office. I, I think they need to be held to account. I think they need to be more accountable and more transparent in the dealings. And I, and I for one, over the last decade, uh, particularly fed up that judges in this country or the authorities see everything as an affront to their authority. I think they need to come into the 21st century. But I don't buy the fact that the media necessarily have those genuine interests at heart and that's why they're doing this. Um, I think the, the, the analogy you drew of Parliament is a false one. The courts 
uh, when you talk about Parliament having cameras in there, um, the courts are not supposed to be dictated to by public opinion. That's the central issue here. Donald was right. It's about justice. It's not about personal party interests. It's about the rule of law that should apply. And I don't think public outrage of what should happen in certain cases should translate into pressure on judges or lawyers in, in doing what is already an extremely difficult job. And I, I understand what you're saying about the question of streaming. Um, but if we take the one example of where the Lord President has allowed um, a, a film team um, access to, to lawyers, um, to the court system, Windfall Productions on behalf of Channel 4. Um, I've met with Windfall a number of times and they made approaches for, for a couple of trials. And the concern that I stepped back from it eventually was this, that yes, they would follow us about for something like six months to a year and eventually produce you know, something that's not sensational and try and do the job. The bottom line still was, it would be one prime time entertainment and filming us um, lawyers, prosecution and defense and judges and witnesses would eventually all be compartmentalized into a one hour documentary that would eventually go out um, um, on television. And uh, the, the question of live streaming is this, I'll say this, um, it really contradicts with where STV and BBC um, is at this moment because they don't even have the resources during a high court trial to have a cameraman there through the whole course of a day to film what's going on. Um, they usually have to bring in contractors or somebody to come and film it. And what they do is they bring the cameraman in for the most sensational aspect. And then the reporter will go running out to do it. What is to stop those TV companies taking the most sensational aspects out of that streaming thinking, right, we will, we will produce the documentary or we'll put that on TV uh, and the, the, the added problems with that. And with regards to Alistair um, saying that, um, in, in regards to the idea of the sun printing, he's guilty, hang him or whatever, um, and saying that there's no research and that justifies that the jury would reach a conclusion. That is the key point. There is no research into what is going on in the jury room because under the present law, we're not allowed to ask a jury as to what they understood of the directions, whether they had any knowledge from the internet about prior to the case. There's much opinion, there's much speculation about what goes on in the jury room um, or what they might do on the computers at home, but it's no more than speculation. And maybe within the 21st century, it's about time that we stop looking at this as though this is the 19th century or the 20th century, and we started saying we should have research into it. Um, it is, we should be able to ask questions of jurors what is going on. We don't have jury vetting in this country, but maybe it is now time that jurors should be given written guidelines of exactly what their roles and their responsibilities are, as well as an explanation of what is an unacceptable conduct. I say in my submission, it's very diff difficult and very rare for a juror ever to stand up and say something has gone wrong and occasionally they do do it, and it's fantastic when they do do it, um, saying that something has gone wrong in the jury room. But it's very rare, but they don't even know how to go about doing it. They don't know whether it's right for them to do it. And uh, unlike the film 12 Angry Men, I suspect it's not really like 12 Angry Men in every jury room within this country. And with the, with the advances in technologi technology, it really is essential that we do revisit the contempt of court, and we do start to look at what, what is best place to, to drive justice. The issue is one of justice. Public interest also is one of achieving justice. It's not just simply a question of, of getting cameras into a courtroom. Uh, thank you very much. A, extremely interesting uh, discussion. I'm sure it could go on much longer, but we can't. Um, I want to call Rod Campbell, followed by um, Graham Pearson. You want to ask questions, Rod? Um, just a quick point. Is, does anybody have concerns about the filming of witnesses, or for that matter, solicitors? and counsel uh, going to, coming to court. Anyone want to comment? Is that, is that an irrelevant, I mean, it's one of the issues we want to raise. Yes, I'm... It, it already happens. Witnesses are filmed arriving into court. Witnesses are filmed going out of court. Um, solicitors and counsel are filmed coming in and out of court. So I, I don't think it's really so much of an issue. And the court has a process already by which they can say that certain witnesses who are vulnerable, applications can be made that they shouldn't be filmed. Um, and on certain occasions, I know um, during the Sheridan trial, for instance, that attempts were made for, for certain high-profile um, witnesses to try and disappear out the, the, the back doors of the court. Um, that wasn't allowed to happen. And the fact was that they were public witnesses. There was no applications made, and, and so be it. They, they, they were filmed. I don't think it should go beyond the, the steps of the court, though. I don't think people should be followed, you know, all the way up the street to the car park. Um, I think that's unacceptable. When they come in and out of court, that's fair game. Alan McCloskey, you perhaps want to comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would disagree with Alwar on that point. Uh, we do have examples of the media chasing people who have got, come through and exited from a rear door or a side door to a court 
in the in the in the interests of of the media. It doesn't happen very often. Um, an accidental or having a TV camera that's got the public coming in and out is one thing, but we have examples of the media who have chased people t to their car, which is completely unacceptable. Yeah, and it is absolutely unacceptable. So what happens to the media if they do that is that any, any re retribution it just happens and that's it, tough. But there is no retribution. And again, that's why these laws need to be revisited because victims, whether they be victims, whether they be, I mean, I think that we, we also always assume that victims necessarily mean those who are giving evidence against the accused. The victims can sometimes be the accused as well. I think they have to have a right to be able to of recall and uh, it's not necessarily the case of defamation or taking action against a newspaper, which we've seen in recent times are all extremely powerful. And unless you've got a lot of money, there's not very much you can do about it. Steve Rayburn, do you want to come in on that particular point very, very and then on the same point, right? Just yes. very briefly, yes. Perhaps the issue of um, witnesses uh, or anybody being filmed coming to and from the court is simply done in the absence of any other available material. Um, if the court process um, was filmed as I've proposed it might work, it could provide a library of additional material for them to use <coughs> instead of people coming in and out of court. There'd well, be no need. To fiddly space. I, I, I don't think he needs to say anything. I'm, I'm, I'm very hesitant to disagree with Learning Council, but I'm afraid we don't have the same point of view on this one. <laughs> could I just get Mr Bonington first? I think he's, he's waiting. I, I, I quite understand what Mr McCloskey is talking about, but that situation seems to me to be perfectly covered both by the common law and from the Protection from Harassment Act, uh, that if a complaint were made to the police that uh, by the victim, if we call them that, um, that, that, that matter could be dealt with there and then. In fact, my memory is that outside Kilmarnock Sheriff Court, um, there was a press photographer who was arrested. It was an FAI, and it was a very terrible FAI. I think children had been burnt to death. And understandably, the family said, look, we don't want photographed. And despite that, a, photo, a photographer from a newspaper, one of the ones I don't like, uh, didn't take the hint, and he was arrested. Uh, so I, d I don't see... There is, there is, there is a I think there is, yes. Uh, Helen Arnott, please. Yeah. Point, that the broadcasters too should not be overstepping the mark and they should be either self-regulating under the codes or if there's criminal prosecutions then fine. Are you about to make the same point? In which case Just to say bothered. that in terms of Alistair, in terms of, uh, yes, agreed they may well be common law, but I know in, in recent times with two high-profile trials where the, the behaviour of the media has been an absolute you know, scramble to get like 100 photographers, cameras, etc., to surround yourselves as you're walking out the court, trying, the, the, the accused are trying to get to the car. It's the middle of winter, there's ice, people almost falling over, getting trampled upon. And the, the police <coughs> have seen their role as, well, they're there for the court. It's not their job to police outside the court and to carry on. And fair enough, in those occasions, the police tried to sit sentiment, but they didn't take any action, and it was impossible. They, they're doing their job policing the court, and it wasn't their job to police outside the court or in the car park. But we were followed, literally, you know, for that, that journey that normally takes you 30 seconds. That took something like 20 minutes, and I was surprised that somebody wasn't seriously injured at the time. And uh, it is unacceptable that, that, that it's the doors of the court you're coming into the courtroom, if you're a vulnerable witness or if you need to go out the back, fair enough. But as it comes to leaving that court, then you, you place people in jeopardy, as in their cars, when they're getting to car. What if you're a witness? You don't want your number plate being filmed. Um, which car you're driving, whether you're with your children, whether you're with your family, why should that be, you know, if you're not giving evidence, why should you be getting filmed coming into court? Thank you. Graham Pearson, you want to? <coughs> yes, I've got Colin Keir after that. Yeah. I think it returns to the point that uh, Stephen Rayburn addressed in, in his uh, part of our, our discussion. If um, Donald Finlay, as a, a defence agent, raises issues about um, the safety of witnesses and, and accused in the court, and they're confirmed by David Harvey and referred to by John Cuddihy and also referred to by Amir Anwar, um, it seems to me that in the kind of provision that you've suggested about um, live running of the court process, do you suggest that all people who are part of that process would be seen on television? Would you suggest that people going into that court would be able to uh, utilise uh, the freedom 
not to be broadcast. Um, how would this process work? Do you just reject the fact that witnesses will feel intimidated in, in these circumstances? Mr. Rayburn, yeah. <coughs> um, thank you. Yes, the, um, uh, the question of does this impact the administration of justice, I think, is the answer to that. Um, if um, someone. No, is... can, can I stop there? Yes. Um, it's a fairly simple question about people going into court to play their part, their citizens' duty to adhere to the administration of justice. You've heard from people who are practitioners in the field from long experience, and they're suggesting that ordinary people, whether witnesses or accused, are frightened, feel intimidated, and that the presence of cameras broadcasting to the world would add to that situation and is likely to have an impact on the way processes operate. Do you just reject that and, and don't accept that, or do you feel that in the interest of the public, we should bypass that concern at a very key moment in deciding the guilt or innocence of a person in our courts? Yes, I think Mr. Pearson has touched on the balance of the answer there. Yes, is you, 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 you need to put the two things together. Uh, and no, you don't um, override um, the concerns of people, of course not. But um, the, uh, the vulnerabilities, the sensitivities, the fear, uh, and these are, these are very real traumatic things. Obviously, the many people that come to give evidence in court are traumatised before they start, whether they're witnesses or, or the victim of the crime. Sure. That's a starting point, and that exists in any event. So the question to be asked is, would broadcasting it compound that, or would it add to it? Would it inhibit any of this? Um, now, uh, if there is evidence that it does, and I think that's something which certainly this committee and this parliament would have to look at carefully, is there any evidence for this that needs to be uh, advanced? And if so, does it outweigh uh, the, um, uh, the public interest in justice being seen to be done properly and appropriately? Now, that's where the rubber meets the road here. That is uh, where um, the, the, the real issues why? Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, perhaps I maybe didn't articulate it as well as I may have done, but um, if someone is feeling uh, anxious or worse, intimidated, um, that intimidation is not necessarily going to be uh, exacerbated if, um, if the events take place in the south side of Glasgow, but somebody in Banff is watching. They're not really worried about the person in Banff who's watching. They're more worried perhaps about the specific people that are connected to the events. The broadcasting or otherwise isn't going to change that because the, anyone that has a direct interest or direct concern that's causing that fear is already causing that fear. So does the broadcasting enhance it? Does it make a difference? I'm not entirely certain that this stays as evidence to that effect. So going back to part of my original question, everyone going into that court on that day, would they be able to exempt themselves from this performance? Or would you indicate that everyone who enters that court would have no choice in the matter. They would be broadcast. Yes, I think there's a clear answer to that. And I think, um, uh, in fact, I see that Liz Cutting's over there, and, and uh, Elizabeth, as you probably all know, um, has played a very powerful role in uh, moving the judiciary closer towards better and wider communication and has played a key role in facilitating the broadcasting that we've seen already under very strict safeguard, which is principally that the camera's positioned to see the bench and only the bench. Um, the, that, I think, is a, is a great step forward. And I think if you were to broadcast proceedings in entirety, and if the camera were to remain on the bench, and let's say, at most extended to the court professionals, um, the prosecuting counsel, the defence counsel, and perhaps had a push professional witnesses, by that I mean either expert witnesses who are called in, or perhaps police witnesses who can accept it as part of the run-of-the-mill aspect of their job. It is part of a policeman's job police woman, police officer, to um, attend court and give evidence. So but not to it, appear on media? Well, um, that's not part of their duty to do that. That's the question that's up for debate, yes. But they, they do have a role to play in the administration of justice. There's no doubts about that. Sure. Um, so I think if, um, uh, if there was any hint, any possibility that administration of justice could be adversely affected, then you don't take the risk and you would need to ensure that, OK, the camera stays fixed on the bench. And I reiterate the point I made earlier on. Some may think, well, that's quite dull to watch. 
Well, so it's quite dull to watch. We're not talking about entertainment. The purpose is not to entertain. It's not to provide stimulating visuals. It's to provide administration of Would, justice and transparency. I was going to say, because I'm conscious of time, I was going to say this committee can get quite dull to watch as well. Yes. I didn't know we had such a vast audience. Uh, I, I think it'd be useful if you developed your checks and balances argument, which I think you've Put, put to us uh, uh, to some degree as this debate has developed. And rather than try to do it in the limited time, I appreciate you know, the, the line of questioning. But I, want, I know that David Harvey, again, if, if we can have a, a, a brief, brief answer brief. to yes, this, please. Just, just in terms of the point Mr Rayburn raises about um, uh, evidence of, of the position, I think that that evidence arises from what's been alluded to uh, previously about the, the Windfall Farms experience. I mean, the reality is that this is a, a production company which has made significant efforts to, to um, engage uh, with court service, um, with ourselves, with defence and, and, and with uh, witnesses, victims, etc. Et and, and it's fair to say that um, uh, they clearly have experienced um, uh, some uh, concern and reluctance. Um, the Lord President's rules have been uh, modified recently and, and let's see what um, impact that, that has. Uh, just finally, in terms of the, the checks and balances that Mr Rayburn is now referring to, I have a slight uh, concern about that because um, part of the idea is, as I understood it in relation to his original point, was that the um, public can have access, can come into the court, can assess demeanour of witnesses, can see those witnesses, etc. I now understand that there may be some witnesses who won't be seen, might be some witnesses who will only be heard. And, and that, as, as we know, operating in such senses as we have available to us, if, if, if we have the, the use of the five senses, that's how we gain an impression of what's happening round about us. And um, I would have thought that, that um, any limitation on that automatically, by, by definition, begins to skew the interpretation of what's going on. So I would, I would have caution about um, any ideas about um, uh, sanitisation of material. <coughs> Thank, thank you for that. I've got Colin Keir followed by Jenny Mara. Colin. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, actually, part of my question was based on what Graham Pearson's just said, but I've always been of the opinion that the visual image is always stronger anyway than, um, uh, or on most occasions, to that of what appears the following day in the newspapers. Uh, I do have a sort of concern that the discussion surrounding the live uh, broadcasting. And what it doesn't actually um, do is sort out the problem of sensationalism that happens perhaps in the, uh, the evening news. Because regardless of whether or not it's broadcast live or not, Scotland Today and Reporting Scotland and other outlets are still going to start, uh, uh, open up their programmes with a two-minute segment, which is going to do the cherry-picking anyway. So there is still that problem that I don't think that the argument for full live broadcasting uh, that has been made particularly by Mr Raven uh, is really sort of looked at. And the other thing is actually one of the things that you brought in, um, convener, and that was the comments um, during proceedings and, and the likes about victims or alleged um, character defects in some of the main players in the court case. And I think that's something that how can people avoid making some degree of determination on somebody's character if these comments are put out there before a determination has been made by the, uh, the, the court. That's more a comment than a question, but that's Well, fine. it's really, how do, you, how, do you, yes. how do you balance that? I'll leave that somebody once said sticking to a wall somewhere because we'll come to that. And Jenny, please, Jenny Maher. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to, be, um, to leave this session this morning with a clear idea of the advantages of this proposal to, to broadcast trials, because throughout the session this morning, I've not been convinced of the arguments at all. And I think the main proponents, Mr. Rayburn and, and Mr. Linklater, we've heard cited the, uh, the public interest um, and the administration of justice. And Mr. Rayburn also talked about perhaps the um, the change in the rule on double, uh, double jeopardy and perhaps corroboration if it comes about might be elucidated by having a camera fixed on the bench all day long and broadcast on television. I don't see how that would happen. And I would also like to know how the public interest would better be served by the broadcasting all day long of the camera fixed on a bench. Mr Linklater, first. I think there is a very simple answer to that. Television is the most watched media, I mean, in, in, in the world. 
um, and uh, uh, to, to exclude it, the most popular uh, media that we have, the one that has defined our generation, to exclude that from the public process of a trial um, seems to me to be illogical. I, I can't understand, I, despite uh, Don Finley's best arguments, I cannot understand why, if all the safeguards we've been talking about all morning are introduced, which are the same safeguards that govern my media, which is the print media, which is to ensure a fair trial. Uh, if that is not interfered with, I, ca I can't understand the logic of excluding uh, television. How would it assist to make the but administration of justice better? Why, why allow any media coverage of a trial? You allow media coverage because it is the public's right to know what is going on in our courts of law. Can I just simply challenge you on one thing that I do think is a different interaction between people who are on television. Your behaviour changes. That's something that doesn't happen if the press are covering it. Your behaviour is not changing, but it does change if cameras are there. I think if you put on television your behaviour, you, you moderate your yes. behaviour in a certain way, as I would, as anyone else in here would. But I come Will back that not happen in courts? I think it is, I come back to this question of degree, it may, it may change, my behaviour changes if I'm interviewed by a press uh, reporter, of course it changes because I'm suddenly aware that I'm actually talking to somebody who may report <coughs> what I'm saying, but I think, to be honest, that's a matter of degree, how you face up to a television camera may be slightly different from how you face up to a, te to a reporter with a Seven notebook, minutes. but in either way, in either case, uh, your behaviour changes, but only in, in degree. Mm. Yes, Mr. Newman. Just, Jenny, could you ask how is it going to improve? Uh, it's quite simply the principle that the courts are public is there to facilitate the administration of justice. That's an open door court, and that you can be judged by a jury of your peers and the evidence tried in public. That's a fundamental principle. Uh, I would just simply argue that extending it to broadcasting widens the, the, the um, application of that principle. Uh, and I do think that the greater scrutiny, to answer your second point, does it increase? Uh, would, would it impact your performance? Would um, uh, would you behave a little differently? Well, I would simply argue that anybody that goes to court um, as a witness um, is essentially performing, if that's the right way to put it, for the judge, for the um, the jury that are there. There's an element of public performance to it anyway. You're already in public. You're already performing. The people that are there are being careful what they're saying. They are under oath, and they, they, they know that it's for scrutiny, and they know that something very serious is at stake. So, again, my argument comes back to that I don't see that having... The, uh, the presence of a camera or the presence of a, of a slightly wider audience would actually change that. Uh, it may expand the visibility of it. My argument simply is that expanding the visibility is better for the, the, the public administration of justice. The, 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 the scrutiny, the available scrutiny, would improve the performance. I'm just watching body language around the table and thinking cameras would be watching body language around the table. I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to stop. I know there's um, one or two want to come back in, but we've had a good go at this. And I, I would say to you all, um, anything you wish to say additionally, perhaps even uh, reflecting on what's in the official report, and certainly I know members will read that very carefully, uh, please just uh, give us additional um, submissions. It will inform our debate, and I hope inform the Parliament's debate. Uh, really, it's a, a big discussion, uh, and we've opened up a whole lot of cans of worms here, actually, and very difficult issues to address with the balance of uh, freedom of expression against uh, a fair trial. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to suspend now for 10 minutes, committee. And um, thank you.